Hi, and welcome to the Faith Bridge Sermon Podcast. I'm here with Ben Stewart, who just brought us a great message from Proverbs 31, part two of our Above and Beyond series. In a few minutes, we've got some questions to talk about regarding that sermon, but for now, take a look at the message. Good to see you guys. It is so good to be back in Texas. I got to tell you, I brought my seven-year-old Hannah with me and uh, we got off the plane and immediately went to get a uh, proper barbecue so she could taste what it's supposed to taste like. And uh, then we went to an Aggie game and the Aggies won, farmer's fight, so that felt good. And then uh, honestly, and I'm not just saying that because I'm here and I'm like supposed to say something like this to you, but she... Honestly, the thing she was most excited about was coming here. I know, because um, it's, like, it's coming home. There's so many people here that have just loved us so well and loved her so well. She was so excited to be here. So we're just so glad uh, to be here and honored to be in the midst uh, of you this morning. So if you've got a Bible, we're in Proverbs 31. I want to read to you in a second from that. Uh, if you don't have a Bible, there's folks that would love to hand you one. Just throw a hand up and they'll get it to you. Or if you want to just listen to me read it, that's fine. But while you're turning there, Proverbs 31, uh, I'll just say this too. It's been six months since we've been in church in DC meeting on Sunday mornings. And I won't go on and on. I could go forever about it. But just to encourage you, because people wonder like what is happening in DC, what's going on. Uh, let me just say one thing that's happening in DC. And that is the spirit of God is alive and moving in the hearts of people in DC. And it's been crazy to see the hunger for the truth of God's word and the love that's available in God's family. Uh, we've already had to move to do gatherings and create more space for people. And uh, we are growing fast. And it's because of the hunger people have for truth and for love. And so it's been pretty amazing to be right in the middle of all that and see people from all different walks of life, all different parties and affiliations coming to the feet of Jesus and looking for answers has been incredible. So thank you for helping make that possible to create a space for them right in the center of the heart of DC. It's crazy to be right there, truly. And uh, it's amazing. So thank you. Yeah, we're grateful. So Proverbs 31, we're going to start in verse 10 talking about the Proverbs 31 woman, because why not, as a man, uh, teach Proverbs 31? Never heard a guy do it before, but uh, can't mean it's a bad idea, right? Uh, okay, Proverbs 31, beginning in verse 10, uh, says this, an excellent wife who can find. She is far more precious than jewels. The heart of her husband trusts her, and he will have no lack of gain. She does him good and not harm all the days of her life. She seeks wool and flax, works with willing hands. She's like the ship of the merchants. She brings her food from afar. She rises while it is yet night and provides food for her household and portion for her maidens. She considers a field and buys it. With the fruit of her hand, she plants a vineyard. She dresses herself with strength and makes her arms strong. She perceives that her merchandise is profitable. Her lamp does not go out at night. She puts her hand to the distaff and her hand holds the spindle. She opens her hand to the poor, reaches out her hand to the needy. She's not afraid of the snow for her household, for all her household are clothed in scarlet. She makes bed coverings for herself. Her clothing is fine linen and purple. Her husband is known in the gates when he sits among the elders of the land. She makes linen garments and sells them. She delivers sashes to the merchants. Strength and dignity are her clothing and she laughs at the time to come. She opens her mouth with wisdom, and the teaching of kindness is on her tongue. She looks well to the way of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children rise up and call her blessed. Her husband also, and he praises her. Many women have done excellently, but you surpass them all. Charm is deceitful. Beauty is vain. But a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Give her of the fruit of her hands and let her works praise her in the gates. Let me pray for us. Father, I want to thank you for every person in this room, where, wherever they're coming from and walks of life, whatever we're experiencing, be it good or ill in our life, however we conceive of our relationship with you, whether we feel close or don't feel close to you at all, I just thank you that we're all here. And I want to ask you, God, that you would teach us now. Help us understand your word, but not just understand it, be changed by it, God be different people as a result of these few minutes. I want relationships. I want people to be different. 
and we need you to do that. So I would just invite all of you, if you're willing, to, to pray and ask him. Say, God, please teach me this morning. Uh, and then if you would, please pray for me, that the Lord would use me and I'd be helpful to you. Well, Father, we love you and we trust you. Use this time and we pray that in Jesus' name, amen. Well, early on in my marriage to Donna, we were invited to speak at an event, be involved in a ministry event. And at the end of it, we were coming out and they were loading all their gear into a trailer that was pulled by a truck. And I remember at that point, they looked over at me and they were like, Ben, uh, can you back this trailer up into this parking spot? And the way they asked it, like, can you? I was just like, oh, come on. So I just was like, yes, of course I can. <laughs> yeah, right? And so they're like, oh, good. And threw me the keys. Can you back it up? And I got in the car and was like, dude, I have no idea what I'm doing. <laughs> like, I've never backed up a trailer in my life. Uh, but I was proud. So I was like, man, I got this. It can't be that hard. Instantly, like, bam, hitting curbs and jackknifing it. And it's just a train wreck. Little embarrassing. People are like, are you confused? Is he okay? All this kind of stuff's happening. Meanwhile, my wife is sitting next to me just very gently asking, do you need some help? Would you like me to take over? And I'm like, no. No, I don't. I'm fine. Right? But as this whole performance continues, I notice uh, the young ones begin to gather. You know, as the crowd is forming, uh, I realize I am living out a principle for the kids, and that is it's the fool, right, who claims to be wise. It is the wise who is humble enough to say, I actually don't know what I'm doing. And so it struck me as that moment, my wife has been a worship leader driving a truck with a trailer filled with worship gear all around America for years. She's the one who drives it, can drop a trailer on a dime. Maybe I should let her take over. So I was just like, yeah, okay, why don't you do this? She gets in the wheel instantly, bing, just drops it exactly where it should be. And I was like, you know, that is a skill that uh, you will pass along to our kids. And that's fine. I will teach them how to shoot a gun and read a book and you can teach them this, right? But why am I mentioning all this? Because we have a book in our Bible called the book of Proverbs. In the book of Proverbs, its goal is to give you wisdom, competency in the complexities of life. That as I'm being handed certain powers that we got, I don't know how to, to use these. That's the, the building blocks of wisdom in the book of Proverbs, the humility to say, if you hand me something powerful, I don't know if I know the best way to handle it. And so it's written primarily to young people. Young men, young women at the very front end of life, front end of decision making, and they're being handed these powerful forces of money and sex and relationships and saying, hey, I don't know how to handle this. Someone give me wisdom. Someone give me an understanding of how the world works and how to best work within it, to how to get my hands on the wheel of this and how to steer this thing, not into calamity, but opportunity. How can I use my words, my money, my relationships to build life, not tear it down, to do something constructive, not destructive? That's the book of Proverbs, competency and the complexities of life. It's about the skill of living. And so for 30 and a half chapters, it's been presented primarily as a dad talking to his teenage son, looking at his son on the front end of making his own decisions life and just saying, before you step out there into relationships with a woman, into the work world, into these places, let me tell you the best I got. And it's a dad leaning down and, and frankly doing what all of us wish we had a dad to do, to lean down and say, this is the best I got as you step into a dangerous world. Here's how to navigate it. And some of you had a dad like that. And as the years go by, you're increasingly more grateful for a dad who would do that. If you didn't have that, we have the word of God. We have the book of Proverbs for us. That you see this dad is presenting to you truth. And it's not just his best opinion. He's saying, hey, this is the word of God. God built this world and God knows how the world works. So if you get around this and understand the world of God, then you can know how it works and how to work well within it. That's the book of Proverbs. And so for 30 and a half chapters, he's been telling the son, be wise, pursue wisdom, get smart, learn from me. And then now here at the very end in this last part of Proverbs 31, he's gonna say, and when it comes time to marry, marry a woman who pursues wisdom too. You be a son that pursues wisdom and then partner up with somebody who wants wisdom as much as you do. He began the book by telling his boy, pursue lady wisdom. 
And he presents wisdom metaphorically as a woman. He's like, woo her son, get near her, go to her house, eat her food, listen to her words, sit at her feet, learn from her son. And then now, as we get to the end of the book, this metaphor solidifies into reality. And he says, son, marry a woman who looks like Lady Wisdom. As you begin to date, as you enter relationships, as you pursue marriage, you get into a place where you're pursuing wisdom, son, and make sure you partner up with a woman who's wise as well because life is hard. And it's interesting, the way the poem's written is it's written like a warrior poem. It's written like poems of heroes in warfare of old. It says an excellent woman, that's the word hayil. It's the same word for warrior or valor or strength. He's saying, marry a warrior woman. That's what you want. Because life is a battle. Life is hard. Life beats you down. And in the midst of the battle, you want to make sure that you're with somebody that's got your back that's not going to stab you in the back. Let me say that again because I don't see anyone writing that down. (laughs) You want to partner up with somebody, husband or wife, that's got your back, isn't going to stab you in the back. That when you're out there and you're back to back against the world, you want to make sure that the way they're using their words and talking about you when you're not around, the way they're spending money, the way they're talking to your kids, the way they use their sexuality is something that's not going to hurt you, but helps you. It's not going to sink a knife into your back, but it's going to be there for you. You want to marry somebody that your lives together are synergy as you step out into a dangerous world. You help each other propel forward. You want to marry someone you can trust. You need a warrior wife. And the fascinating thing is there were a lot of poems about women in the ancient Near East when this was written. And here's the crazy thing. They sound just like the modern poems about women in our culture, modern songs. So you think about the modern songs, think about all the pop songs that are out there right now, top of the charts. What do they talk about as they extol women? Usually their uh, character and their virtues and and their work with nonprofits, right? (laughs) No. It's all about her booty and, and how good she is at backing it up and it, in various states of undress, how it looks in certain lighting, right? It's all about that. That's what ancient Near Eastern poems about women were like too. It's funny, like paleonographers are studying ancient scripture. You're like, she can back that thing up. Oh, oh that's, I mean, that's, that's, it's the same. Message hasn't changed. That what the culture tells young men is a woman is useful as long as she's sexual. And that's really it. And that's how a lot of us end up interacting with women online or in the world, that kind of thing. That's how the culture does it. It's not good. Now, is sex supposed to be fun? Yes. And that's earlier in the book of Proverbs. He tells the son, you want to marry a woman that you're always intoxicated with her love. Get drunk in her love. Son, go crazy. Enjoy her breast forever. Different sermon. Can't talk about it. But he's just telling the son, y'all need to have an adventurous sex life. Have it be amazing. But the person you're having sex with needs to also be your haloop, your best friend. She share, you share your heart and she shares hers. And it's, it's your warrior buddy in life that y'all face the hardships of life. You raise the kids together. You fight against this world together. You get out there together. It's meant to be all of that. There's, it's a three-dimensional picture of a woman. And here in this passage, he shows you something very different from the culture then and the culture now. Let me show you what a strong woman looks like. This is who you want to be paired up with in life. Now, let me clarify some things before we jump in real quick, and that's this. I know that whenever you say Proverbs 31 woman in church circles like this, there's a lot of people that you've heard it all your life, so you're like, oh, okay, hold on one second. And you're just like, dude, always hear about this. It's an impossible standard you put on women. And you go, look, there's nothing in this poem that hasn't already been said to this young man in the book of Proverbs. This is actually the wisdom of Proverbs distilled and presented to this woman. So it's not a unique standard for the woman. It's a high standard for men and women. Same principles now applied to both. And yet other people read it and go, well, look, the woman, I mean, she's got a textile industry and she's like, you know, got vineyards and it's all this pressure. You're like, Ben, I don't know anything about fashion and the soil around here isn't even conducive to vineyards. How am I supposed to live up to all this? And meanwhile, what's the guy doing anyway? He's just sitting there eating chips. You're like, no, (laughs) this isn't showing you women's work over against men's work. Women are told, you don't want to marry a sluggard. You marry a guy that's industrious and work hard, right? It's not just women raise the kids. This book is a dad raising a son. And it's all supposed to do it together. This isn't women's work against men's work. This is telling a son, son, you pursue wisdom and marry a woman who's doing the same thing, right? And you're not supposed to do everything she does. Oh, I got to have a textile industry now? No, but you're meant to extract principles and they're principles that apply to men and women. I'm going to present it how the text does primarily talking to a man about the kind of woman you want to marry or women, the kind of women you want to be. But these are principles that apply to men and women. 
Does that make sense? Have we caveated this thing to death? Oh, great. Let's jump in. Okay. It's got an intro in the first three verses, and we kind of already did it. Proverbs 31.10 says, an excellent wife, a hyel wife, a warrior wife. Who can find? It's hard to find one of these. She's more precious than jewels. She's valuable. And verse 11 tells you why. Because the heart of her husband trusts her, and he will have no lack of gain. That word gain is the word spoil. It keeps using the warfare imagery. That she goes out, and you know that when you're facing the world with her, you're going to win. And when you're out there and the world's dangerous, you know she's not going to be dangerous. No one can hurt you like your spouse. The most painful songs are the ones written by someone that got close and broke away. It's painful. So that person can bring so much life into you or they can bring rottenness to the bones, Proverbs will say. You make sure you get with somebody that your heart trusts them, what they're doing when you're not around, with your money, with their sex, with their words, what's happening. You want someone who, verse 12, does him good, not harm, all the days of her life. That at every stage in the continuum of their relationship, they're doing good to one another that I can trust you, I can trust you. And then it steps into what makes her so excellent. And really the poem breaks into three parts. And the first part is verses 13 through 18. And it's about her productivity, her productivity. She gets stuff done. And you see it in verse 13. It says, she seeks wool and flax and works with willing hands. She is industrious industrious. Look at the words. It says she seeks and she works. She's not getting forced. You're not having to kick her to get her moving. This woman's getting out there. And what she's doing is she's taking raw materials, wool and flax, and she's exerting her energy on them to make them something valuable for the community. You found out later that she's in the fashion industry. She's making textiles for the community, that she's taking raw material, exerting her energy to make something beneficial for the community. That's what she's doing. And let me tell you something, that's not unique to women. That is Genesis chapter one. That in Genesis one, God takes nothing and he makes the world in which we can flourish. And then he looks at the man and the woman and says, I've given you raw materials, cultivate. What does cultivate mean? Take the raw material and you exert your energy to position it in such a way so that those crops are maximally fruitful, so the world flourishes. You bring your energy to the raw material to make it something better to benefit us. It's what Jesus said to his church, pragmatitza, make a profit. I will give you a talent, invest that talent to make more so the community's better because you exist. I had a professor in seminary that he said, if we dropped you on a desert island by yourself and then came back a year later, what would we find? What would be there? What would be the result of your industry? Would you be like Robinson Crusoe that's built a multi-level condo up in the trees and you're like, let's take this complex pulley system up to the library just off the lanai. Like, would that be you? Or would you just be sitting in the dirt half naked talking to a volleyball like, ah! like what would be the result of your energy, right? That you want to marry somebody that you go, man, when they enter a social circle, that social circle's better. That when they step in, they're a thermostat, not just a thermometer. A, thermos, a thermometer adjusts to the room. A thermostat changes it. That when they enter the environment, they change things. That if everyone's gossiping, they don't go, yeah, I guess they're lame too, because everyone's doing it. You go, no, this is a person that's out there, and they're working to change the culture. That they're making things better as a result of their influence. You want somebody that their friendship group, their roommates, their social sphere, those around them are better because they exist. They know how to work hard. But it's not just work. You see in verse 14, she is like the ships of the merchant. She brings her food from afar. She's not just a hard worker and industrious. She is creative. She's creative. They say she's like the merchant ships because that would be amazing. Back then, there wasn't a lot of world travel. So it, you lived in the same place, saw the same people who wore the same clothes, and you ate the same food every day of your life. So if a ship came from far away bringing exotics, that's pretty exciting. You come up and you're like, oh my gosh, everyone would gather around the shore and be like, ooh, is that velvet? Is that a papaya? What does that taste like? It's exciting. And what it's saying is this woman is not just doing the bare minimum to keep the people around her alive, that she's making it creative, that she's going to make meals that are creative. We want that. When you go to restaurants, you don't just want to keep going to one where that's like, it's edible, keep you alive. You want to go, you're like, can you fix it up a little bit? Can we work on our presentation? Can you dim the lights maybe? Like you want to go someplace where it's not just boring and same old, there's some creativity to add value to the people's lives around you. It's like, that's what this woman does. She's creative. Now, does this mean she's a good cook? I don't know. It says she brings her food from afar. So maybe she's cooking it. Maybe she's just calling Uber Eats and she picks cool restaurants. You fill that in. But the point is she's creative and it benefits the people around her, right? 
Uh, man, I'll tell you, at Passion City Church, we value creativity. We want that. We seek out, man, you got a gift in photography, you got a gift in videography, you got graphics, you got an environmental design, can make a space look amazing. We want you to put you to work. Why? Because we know when you walk into a space and you go, man, they just got this set out here and this is so, and that looks amazing. This is so cool. It's like they were anticipating we were here. We know that creativity communicates value to people. They thought about me. They thought about my experience. They wanted me to have a good time here and it opens the door for truth. And so creativity is a gift. This woman's like a merchant ship and you want somebody like that, that they're always learning and bringing something fun into the relationship. She's industrious and she's creative, but not just creative for her. You see in verse 15, she rises while it is yet night and provides food for her household and portions for her maiden. I love it. That word food I, I wish the translation, it's the word pray. What it's saying is she's not just a merchant ship, she's a lioness. That she's up while it's still night like a lioness and she is hunting her prey to bring it back to her pride. I just love that. That you go, this woman is dangerous. There's a little crazy back there. Some fire in the eyes. You know what I mean? That you go, man, while it's still dark, she's out there getting it, and she's going to get what she needs to get done. She's going to go make this happen, that you see this woman is out there like a lioness hunting. She's not life's victim. She's a victor. She's an overcomer. But here's what's interesting. She's not just like, she's out there to get hers, because that's the message a lot to young women. Girls, you just go get yours. You live your dream. You do what you want. You make your money. You go ahead, girl, and it's all about you, 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 but that's not the hero. You see this heroic woman, yes, she's out there at night. Yes, she's getting that prey, but it's for her household and for her maidens. It's to provide for the young ones that she's raising, her kids, and for her maidens. Who are those? They're the young ladies she hired for this textile operation she's running. (laughs) Or they're the young women, which was common back then, that are orbiting around her to learn from her and that she's mentoring. And what you see is she is sacrificial. She's not just industrious and creative. She's sacrificial. I will disadvantage me. I'll get up at night for your advantage. I will struggle so you can succeed. I will take on difficulty so you can flourish. She's sacrificial. That's what a hero is like. Every hero movie you watch is like that. The hero does what? Sacrifices themselves so that the community can live. That's what a hero does. Andy Stanley said it this way, the measure of a life is how much of it's given away. We celebrate that. A hero says, I'm gonna work hard, but I'm gonna do it for your sake that you win. My mom was like this. Single mom, raising three kids, it's not easy to do. And yet while she was here, she had to go back to work, get a full-time job, and so she became a school teacher. But she had a couple options in front of her, and she chose to be the school teacher of parenting and pregnant high school girls. And she said, I'm going to step into these girls that are in a crisis pregnancy situation and I'm going to teach them. And she found out pretty quick as she's teaching them in the school district, a lot of them are dropping out. And the reason they're dropping out is because they don't have the money to provide daycare while they're in school. They can't do it. So my mom, not part of her job description, not part of her job, just started staying up late at night and I would watch my mom write these applications for grants all over the country. And she just got a bunch of grant money coming in so she could look at these girls and say, stay in school, I will pay for the daycare for your kids. And then she saw that a lot of them were in situations where healthcare wasn't something they could figure out or get a hold of. And so she would get nurses involved. So she could look at this young teenage mom and say, you get your education. I will pay for your daycare and I will pay for a nurse for your kids. And then I will get you into a college. And so while she's raising three young kids to survive, she is also changing the trajectory of families forever through her job. So much so that when she was done, and it was time for her to retire, she handed that off to a girl that had gone through the program, that had come to her as a scared teenage mom, got an education, got her kid cared for, got a master's, got a degree, so as my mom was retiring, she could hand the baton to one of these girls she raised so she could continue to be a wake of blessing out in the Katy area. That's a hero. That's a high yield. That's a strong woman. That's the kind of person you want in your zone, in your community. Not life's victim, but a victor. That's who you want. Now, is there an abusive version of this of, hey, be a sacrificer and have your dreams stepped on while everyone else wins? Yes, but that's not what this Bible is presenting. That's the word of God is not presenting the abuse. It's presenting a woman who's working with willing hands. She's out there, not a victim, but a victor, an overcomer. That's what you want to be. Sacrificial for the sake of the community. That's what heroes do. 
And then it's interesting, in 16, 17, 18, he repeats the same words of hands and night and merchandise. But what's interesting is he escalates her productivity. Now in verse 16, she considers a field and buys it. And with the fruit of her hands, she plants a vineyard. She's not just industrious, she's shrewd. That she's not just had some success in her textile industry. She is now taking that money and investing it and getting into real estate. (laughs) That she's a learner. That she's out there and saying, you know what? I'm going to keep studying the terrain and seeing how can I maximize the world to benefit the people I'm taking care of. She's sharp. She's shrewd. This is one of the things that attracted me to Donna. When I met Donna, my wife, that she was always a learner trying to understand a culture and that she was trying to figure out how to do things. I want to figure out how to lead that. Or we got in a situation where it was time to buy a house. She's like, I want to understand how to do that. I want to do what realtors do. Every house we've ever found, she found. And the realtor by the end is asking her for advice. It's the craziest thing. And we just had some pipes blow up at our house. By the end of it, I'm kidding you not, the D.C. water people were out in the front yard. And Donna's like, no, nah, it's a storm drain. You cut the storm drain. The guy's like, that's not a storm drain. She's like, watch this. She's showing this. And their GM's like, it's a storm drain, fellas. Miss Donna just shot us. And I'm like, how is she? When did you learn plumbing? And she just is out there learning stuff for our benefit, all right? And it's crazy. It's amazing. So literally, all these plumbers are knocking on our door like, is Miss Donna here? And I'm like, yeah, okay. Um, She's sharp, right? Not only that, verse 17, she dresses herself with strength. Now, you go, dresses herself. I just thought that was normal human life. Why is that something uh, really powerful? It says she dresses herself with strength. And here's what I love about that. That dresses herself, it's literally the word girds up her loins, which let me explain, because it sounds weird. Um, it's actually warfare language. It's actually used a lot in the Bible to talk to men. Men would say that to other men when they were going off to war, because when it was time to throw down, you know, everyone wore robes. I don't know if you've ever tried to run in a robe. <laughs> Difficult. Yeah, it's not easy. So what you would do is you would gird up your loins. What that means is you would take your robe and hike it up into your belt so you could get ready for action. You could run, because the world's dangerous, and I'm ready. And it says about this woman, she girds up her loins with strength and she makes her arms strong. What I like about that is the assumption that they're not naturally so. What it's telling you is she's got grit. She's got perseverance. That's her next characteristic. That life is hard and it will knock you down. You don't always get to win. That life will put you in the dirt. But what she does is she gets up, girds her loins and makes those arms strong. I know life is hard. I know it beats me down, but I will continue to rise and I won't quit. I won't give up. There is steel in the fiber of this woman. There's perseverance and you want that. This is why I love the new Star Wars movies. It's controversial, I know, for different reasons, but I just love that there is a female hero at the center of it, Ray, that doesn't have to step on the heads of men in order to be a hero, but that she's out there and she's wearing clothes and has pants and that one of her defining characteristics is perseverance, that life deals her a hard hand, but she keeps overcoming, keeps rising, keeps learning, keeps growing. I like that as a dad of young girls, I like that there's a hero in front of them that I can say, that's a heroic quality, be like that. I love that. You wanna be somebody that when life beats you down, you stand back up and make your arms strong. You want perseverance. Uh, one of Donna and I's friends, uh, couples, is Jay and Catherine Wolf. They are just amazing. If you've never read their book, Hope Heals, it's absolutely incredible. Catherine, uh, early in their marriage, had a budding acting career out in L.A. And then she had a stroke. A young girl, beautiful young girl, crazy, that had this stroke and severely limited her physically in a wheelchair. Half her face not operating the same hard hand to be dealt. But what I love about Catherine is she did not take on the mantle of victim, that uh, she lost none of her sense of humor, that if she was in here, I promise she would be yelling at me from the back because she's got a little crazy in her. (laughs) In the best way, she is funny and she is powerful. She took this difficulty and now she preaches all over the country and her and her husband minister about how God can take disability and turn it into strength. And she has helped so many people move through difficult times. Now even runs a camp where people with all kinds of different disabilities and difficulties come, coming to know Jesus, coming to know grace, seeing a future for their life. There can be great things ahead of you even through the pain. There is such an enormous wake of blessing behind her because she turned calamity and opportunity. 
She just had perseverance. I am not life's victim. I'm a victor. I'm an overcomer. It's amazing to meet people with that kind of resolve, right? And this woman's got it. And you want to marry somebody like that. You want to marry a man like that, that he doesn't curl up and become an emotional cripple when life's not going his way. And you want to marry a woman like that, that she's strong. She keeps learning and keeps growing. She makes her arms strong. She's got perseverance. And when you got that, that means you get to have peace. And that's verse 18. She perceives that her merchandise is profitable and her lamp doesn't go out at night. I love that verse because it's saying she knows what it is to work hard and then play hard. She knows that it's hard work and then you get to rest. It's hard work and then you get to enjoy. You know what? My merchandise is good. I did a good job. She gets the euphoria of knowing she did well. It's that moment we cheer for. I mean, think about the last time you watched the Olympics. Those little gymnast girls, right? And you watch them and you know what they had to endure, their perseverance. You're like, that sweet girl has never tasted a cookie in her life. She's been doing push-ups since age one. She's known nothing but pain and calluses and flipping around on bars. That's been her whole life. She comes out there without an ounce of body fat. And as you're watching her, you're like, this is her whole everything. And you see her on that mat flipping around. What are you doing? You're engaged. Like, stick the landing, baby. Don't take that step, right? And when they have feet plant, and she doesn't step. And then you see that rush of euphoria on their face when they know they did it. What do you do? You rise up off your couch. You set your drink down. You're like, girl, you did it. You did it. And as you see her smile, you're like, you deserve that. You own it, girl. She's taking victory laps. And you're like, nobody stop her. This is her moment. You know she worked hard. She deserves that joy. Get her on that Wheaties box now. You know she should feel that euphoria because she worked hard. And that's what this text is saying. This woman knows what it is to persevere. And then she gets to know peace. She gets to know just having a meal at night and just enjoying the fact that God's provided and she did a good job. And I love that. It says in the text that her lamp doesn't go out at night. And I know some people read that and you're like, so she stays up and works at night? You're like, Ben, like she was already waking up all still night. Now she's going to bed at night. You're like, Ben, studies tell us that eight hours of sleep is really the maximum amount people need. Uh, that you're telling me this poor woman is uh, up late. And, uh, no, what it's saying in this verse, her lamp doesn't go out at night. It's interesting. Staying up late at night is not something that's celebrated in the Bible. Uh, and, and culturally, what you see around this time is that, you know, when the sun goes down, they didn't have electricity. You would feel, fill your lamps with oil and light them, and that's how you'd light up the house. And if someone didn't have any money, they didn't have any oil. And so there was a statement about people, like when they were on hard times and they were poor, the statement was, yeah, he sleeps in the dark. And what they mean by that is when the sun goes down, your day's over because you don't have enough money for oil. So what it's saying here is not she stays up late working. What it's saying is she worked hard, and now when the darkness comes, she's got oil for days. That she gets to enjoy provision. She knows she worked hard, and she gets to enjoy that there's been fruit from her labor. She gets to enjoy it. That's a good thing. But here's what's cool about it. She doesn't just get to enjoy that she's productive. You see in verse 19 and 20 what I think is the most powerful pivot as it moves to the next section. It says she puts her hand to the distaff and holds her hand to the spindle. Those are the tools she needs to work hard. But then in verse 20 it says, but she opens her hands to the poor and reaches out to the needy. That's where there's power. That she knows what it is to grip hard work but then she opens her hands to those who are hurting. She's figured out how to be industrious and generous. When I preached this in DC, I preached that first part and I was like, I know every young woman in this crowd knows what it is to work hard. Cause you look at them and you're like, this is a crowd of lionesses, right? And you go, but the real power is when you can take all that energy and not just work hard, climb the mountain and then wonder what you're doing up there. But you say, no, I've worked hard. I've been successful for what? So I can help people. That's where the power is. And we struggle as a culture to pull those things together, industrious and generous. That it's interesting. Uh, You see statistically that the states in the country that are the most generous are usually the ones with the lowest incomes. That people know what it is to suffer and so they help those in need. But as people are industrious and successful, they tend to forget those who have fallen on hard times. A power is when people pull those together. When you see a church like that, When you see a people who say, you know what? I'm gonna be a success in life. I'm gonna be a producer so I can be a provider so that those who are hurting around me benefit because I exist. That's where the power is. Oh, for a church like that. 
One of the most impressive women like that I've ever met is from this church, George Ann Reitmeyer. That I remember when I came here as a young man out of college watching George Ann. Her kids were grown. Her kids were older than me. But she saw in the culture around her in this community that a lot of kids were struggling. A lot of them were on free and reduced lunches that didn't have... A, a, they had a fragility to whether or not they'd be able to eat uh, three meals a day. And so Georgian jumped back into the school district, started working in the school district. Her kids are already out of school. She doesn't have to do this anymore. Not her kids. But she looks around. She's like, I know what it is to work hard. My kids have succeeded, but I'm looking around and seeing needs around me. I'm going to step in for the sake of these kids. Unbelievable. I remember too, as I was visiting with her, she was like, yes, yeah, so we've been helping these schools get food for kids so they can be fed. They can know a meal is going to be here as they get an education and they'll stay in school. And then she said, yeah, there was a pornography shop that opened up on the corner, not far from here by where the kids would walk to school. And she was like, yeah, so they opened up the shop. And I was like, oh man, it's such a tragedy. And she's like, yeah, I know. So we jammed them and they moved. And I was like, whoa, 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 what? what? She's like, yeah, we jammed them. So they ended up moving. I was like, no, no, no. Who is we? And what is jamming them? I don't even understand what you're saying. She's like, we jammed the phones. I'm like, who is that? She's like, I got a group of women together. And we said, we don't want all this pornography around where our kids are. So uh, we just called the guy every single day, every minute of the day for his entire life. And she was like, and we weren't mean to him. You know, we were just telling him like, yeah, you know, you're in the image of God. You have value, but what you're selling is filth and trash. And we run away from our kids. So please move. And she was like, so we just stayed in his world constantly until he sold the building, got out of there and moved. And I was like, he moved? She's like, yeah, he moved. And I'm like, you... You just jam the phones. <laughs> like, that's not like a job. You just say that like that's a thing people do. <laughs> but it is the thing that heroes do. They see the needs in their community and say, I'm going to use my power so that the world wins. I'm going to use my industry to be generous so that the needy win. For a church like that, man. For a church like that. I probably told this story before, but I, I remember at Breakaway, there was a young girl that, that wanted to build a house, an orphanage in Africa, and uh, asked me if I would marshal Breakaway to do it. And I'm like, I can't do it. We were already supporting multiple ministries. I'm like, you can't do it. So this little sophomore college girl came back a year later and told me, hey, we built it. I'm like, what do you mean we built it? She's like, the house, we built the house. I was like, who's we? She's like, my roommates, college kid. I was like, how'd you do that? She said, bracelets. I'm like, what? She's like, bracelets. We made bracelets, sold them. Raised $50,000, built a house. And I'm like, that's just crazy. That's one of the coolest things I've ever heard. That you scan the horizon and see needs and say, I'm going to be industrious so I can be generous, so that the world is better because I existed. That's the kind of person you want to be, and that's the kind of person you want to marry. That you're in a house with somebody who's looking for ways to elevate the position of people around them. You want to be around somebody like that. It says in verse 21, she's not afraid of snow, which again, doesn't sound like a big compliment. You're like, we're not either. We're in Texas. <laughs> what it's saying is she's not afraid of snow for her household and her cl she, they are clothed in scarlet. What that means is she's thoughtful. She's not just meeting needs now. She's anticipating needs. She says, I know cold weather's coming and my family's going to already have not just some clothes. I got to get expensive dye and scarlet was expensive, hard to come by and it would only fit on high quality dye. She's like, I'm going to get great quality gear for my family. So when calamity comes, they're already ready. And I love that. She's anticipating needs. There's people like that on the staff that this church works so hard. You got staff here that they are already going. There's going to be people who come here that they're going to need some prayer. And you know what? We're going to already have a little card sitting in their lap. They fill it out and there's already a team mobilized to pray for them. There's going to be people here that come to Christ and need someone to pray for them. There's going to be prayer teams ready with name tags already on. There's going to be people who want to get involved and get some community. We're already going to have places for them to serve. All they got to do is fill out an application, get some training, and they can jump in. And six months later, they're going to look up and they're going to have some friends. They're going to have the blessing of knowing they're making a difference in their community. They're going to have all this teed up for you that all you have to do is step into being the kind of person you want to be because there's some women and men around here that are working really hard to create an environment where you can win, you can flourish. That's amazing to me that there's people that say, man, I'm going to do that so you win. They're thoughtful about your needs. They're clothed in scarlet. And verse 22, she makes bed coverings for herself. Her clothing is fine linen and purple. She's not just always helping other people. She got some purple for herself. You know what I mean? Sometimes the lady needs something nice. That's fine. I think that's good for her, you know? But the point is, she does quality work. Is she going to put her hands on something? She doesn't do it halfway. So she's going to get the finest materials. She's working hard. She knows how to make quality 
goods, and so she can be proud of it. Verse 23, her husband is known in the gates, and he sits among the elders of the land. There's a dignity to her family because she's elevated not just her own life, but those around her. She's a thermostat, not a thermometer. She doesn't come in and adjust to the culture. She comes in and changes it. We saw that in D.C. as we moved there. People would say, no one's friendly in D.C. Nobody says hi. Everyone only cares about themselves. The place is dark and it's always darkness and it's cold. And we're like, you know what? But we know Jesus. And so we got something else to offer the world. And you know what was cool is I flew in there with friends from Texas and Atlanta and we would put on community groups where I would teach the word of God. People would sit around in circles and ask people about how their life was going. And you know what happened? People would cry. They said, everyone asked what you do. No one asked, how are you? And people begin to realize, you know, kindness is pretty amazing. Truth is pretty amazing. Love is pretty amazing. And now we don't need to fly in people to help. They are welcome to come. But we have this whole community that's living in D.C. now that believes God can change a human life, that the word of God is true, that love is the better way, and that you have this whole community now pushing back darkness in the city. It's unbelievable to see the church grow as people are inviting their friends, and you're realizing we can be thermostats. Let's change the culture in the city. The people of Jesus have done it in the past, and they can do it today. And that's the kind of person you want to be around, someone that says, I'm an overcomer. I'm going to step into this marriage, and I'm looking at how I can make the world a better place because I exist. She's that way, and the world reaps the benefits. Verse 26, her her mouth opens, there's wisdom. Kindness is on her tongue. She looks well for her household. And so finally, she is worthy of her praise. She's productive. She's a provider. And in verse 28, her children rise up and call her blessed. All the women said, amen. Her husband also praises her. Many women have done excellently. Hail, you surpass them all. Charm is deceitful. Beauty is vain. But a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Give her the fruit of her hands. Let her, be, let her works praise her in the gates. She's productive. She provides. And so she's praiseworthy. And I want to challenge the men in the room too. We live in a culture that is still very much today saying a woman is useful as long as she is sexual. And so, so much of the presentation of women in media and on our screens is the sexualizing of women and young girls. And it's time to start complimenting them for some other things and to be men that are gonna be good at complimenting people. Complimenting people you're dating or married to, but also just genuine, not weird compliments of our community when you see someone do a good job. We need to be a place that builds each other up and encourages each other. This dude's flat killing it. I mean, I don't know if you've noticed this. The poem uh, is an acrostic. He started with the first letter in the Hebrew alphabet, and each line is started with a different letter all the way to the end. This guy is A to Z praising this woman. And not only that, he does a repetition in parallels of key words in the first three verses and the second three, and then switches it in the second part and doesn't do repetition parallels, does a chiastic pattern working towards the middle. This dude's working poetry on multiple levels and got bars for days. People are like, hey, man. This is uh, uh, really hard for women to live up to Proverbs 31. I'm like, think of the guys, dude. Like, this dude's crushing, and I'm just telling my wife, like, um, your hair smells pretty, and it feels good when I pet it. I'm like, I don't know what I'm saying, you know? Uh, it's intimidating, right? But we got to do the best we can. And I would encourage you to encourage one another. Let's be a church where people walk in, and they say, you know, I feel encouraged here. These people build me up. These people compliment me. These people believe in me. Let's be a culture that changes the narrative. There's enough negativity in the world. Let's not be that here. Let's be a safe place here. And then you marry somebody who speaks like that, that you build each other up, don't tear each other down. Donna and I were in Jerusalem last week, which I love saying. I'll be sad when it's been too far away. We were in Jerusalem last week, but we um, were at a dinner with this Jewish couple, and they start Sabbath by singing Proverbs 31 over their wives so cool. I'm not going to do that. It sounds better in Hebrew and I, you know, I don't speak it, it's whatever. But finding a way to compliment uh, regularly, pick one of these attributes and say, you, you excel at that. You crush that. It's pretty amazing. Last thing I want to close with is this. Some people can hear this and you go, well, that was overwhelming. What was that, like 27 points? Like, what am I supposed to do? You got a long list of principles you're supposed to apply. That wouldn't really be the win because you're supposed to see what this woman's like and you're supposed to long for it and say, how do I get that? And what I wanna hand you today and what the book of Proverbs wants to hand you is not a list of principles, but a person. At the very end, it shows you the secret of this woman and actually it's the same words from the very beginning of Proverbs, it's bookended. The one who fears the Lord is to be praised. What's beautiful about this woman is not her living up to a list of principles, it's her proximity to a person, that she knows God 
and those who walk with the wise become wise. And so the more she seeks to know God, the more she becomes like him. And that's what we're all supposed to do. So I hope you don't feel pressured by this. It's not about trying to live up to a standard. It's about embracing a savior. It's not about trying to become a hero. It's about embracing the hero of our story. And as you're near him, you become like him. There is no one who's embodied this better than Jesus Christ. He was industrious, worked hard, built a global movement in less than three years. And then at the pinnacle of its success, sacrificed his life. That he who knew no sin became sin, took all your shame unto himself so that we could be right. Ultimate hero, sacrificing himself so we could flourish. And you see in the New Testament, when people know him, they become this kind of people. You saw the woman at the well. Was she industrious? Yeah, some of us naturally are usually good at some of these things. She's out at the well, drawing water, and yet she was a mess relationally, devastated relationships. But when Jesus comes to her, he doesn't shame her about her failed marriages. And there's no shame here. But he comes to her and he doesn't give her a list of rules. Well, here's five ways you could have improved your marriage. What he does is he comes to her and says, hey, if you knew who you were talking to, you'd ask me and I'd give you eternal life. Water that would flow up out of you like a fountain. And what I love about that is he's gonna give it to her anyway. He's telling her, you've misdiagnosed your need. You've been looking for it in all these other places when it's found in me. You come to the real hero, the son of God, Jesus Christ. And what happened to her when she received the grace of God before she had done a thing? What's the next thing she did? She ran back to her community and said, come meet the person I'm found. And her whole community got to meet the son of God. Her whole community was changed. Why? Because she was changed. She got to know the hero and she became a hero. She didn't need a set of principles, she needed a person. And the more you know Jesus, the more you'll be like him. A provider, an overcomer, someone worthy of praise is the person who reveres God. Says, I don't know everything. I don't know how to drive. I don't know how to use these forces. And so if you've come to be my hero, be mine and teach me to be more like you. The, the end point of this whole message is come kneel before the Son, because when you know the Son of God who has become for us wisdom, you will become wise just like him, and the world will be benefited because of your existence. Let me pray for us. Father, I want to thank you that, God, you hold up to us a beautiful standard, and I pray we wouldn't settle for anything less. I pray the young women in here who aren't married would not settle for anything less than a heroic man. I pray for the young men, they would not settle for a depiction of women anything less than this heroic woman. I pray for us who are in marriages, God, that we would begin to speak to one another with honor and look to care for one another and meet each other's needs. I pray those of us who are single in here would get involved in the community and build up one another in faith, that we would build a spiritual family that's strong and encouraging and vibrant, that we could say, I have a family that builds me up. We are clothed in scarlet and laugh at the days ahead because we're here for each other. God, make us a community like that. More than anything else, God, I pray that if there's anybody in here that hasn't put their faith in Jesus Christ, that this would be their day. And I believe there's some here. That spirituality is not a standard to uphold. It's a savior to embrace. It's not a list of principles to obey. It's a person to love. And I pray, God, there'd be people in here today that trust you. And I would encourage you now, friend, you could tell him, Jesus, save me. Adopt me, rescue me, make me yours. I want to be with you, Jesus. And I trust that when I'm with you, you will make me like you. If I can know the hero, he will make me heroic in due time. You trust Jesus today, friend. Thank you, God, that you're moving in our midst. We love you and we trust you. And we pray that in Jesus' powerful name. Amen. Amen. Welcome to Postscript. Here we hope to answer your questions and help you dig deeper into the messages and sermons at FaithBridge by talking with the teacher of the day.
Hi, and welcome to Postscript. I'm Dan Slagle, Care and Missions Pastor here at Faith Bridge, and I'm with Ben Stewart, who just brought us a, a terrific message, part two of our Above and Beyond series. Yep. And today, Ben, your focus was on Proverbs 31, uh, specifically the amazing description of a Proverbs 31 woman. Yes. Good, good message, man. Thanks. Thank, when thank I heard you. you crushed part one, man, I haven't listened to it yet, but. Well, just trying to keep up with you, friend. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we do have a question okay. which came in, Let's and do I, it. I'm not surprised. I, I actually could have anticipated this. I'm sure uh, there were some women out there hearing this, on the one hand, being very, very encouraged by it and something to aspire to, but on the other hand, thinking, yeah, but I am a wife and I am a working woman and I am a mom and I am this and I am, and just wondering how, yeah. how do I keep everything going, all the plates spinning and, you know, have a, a semblance of balance in my life. Yeah. Wow, that's a great question. I don't know if I'm gonna solve all that. I, I do think it's important to keep in mind with this woman, like when people tend to ask, how do you separate, so should a woman pursue her career and have someone else watch kids, mm -hmm. raise the kids, and then give up the career? How does all that balance? In the ancient world there, your career was out of your home, you know? So mm -hmm. you go, she is in a sense, again, Sewing, is she just sewing clothes for her family? You're like, well, the merchants are wearing her clothes and she's raised profit to buy a vineyard. So you go, she's got more than just a homemaker thing, but, right. but she's at home because really that was all done in the same place, which the world nowadays kind of provides for that. You can do yeah, some to of a that. degree, sure does. But, um, but the text doesn't solve for you the modern challenge we have of typically people go away to work mm -hmm. or you're at home with the kids. And so... Proverbs 31, I don't think should be used to advocate one over the other. Okay. You know, so for me, Donna is at home with the kids. And, you know, if you add up the amount of money we say from her raising them and what she does, you go, then we would more than make up for it mm -hmm. uh, than if she was employed and we were paying people. Um, and she finds ways to influence young women, mentor young women. She's mentoring women who are involved in the work world, and she's found her way mm -hmm. to be a Proverbs 31 woman, but she's not selling textiles. Or you can be out here and be providing for young maidens, some of whom are caring for your kids. There's, there's a version of being the workforce woman or the at-home woman that really fills Proverbs mm -hmm. 31. But that balance of how to do it all, our world has made that challenging for women. And again, yeah. I, I think it's okay. Maybe part of the help is acknowledging, hey, that's challenging. Yeah. And Scripture is not trying to make you one or the other. Sure. Not in Proverbs 31. Do you think it would be fair to say that um, there is no one overarching principle for that situation in life? Rather, it's a case by you know, e each yep. family has to determine what's best for us. Uh, do we have overwhelming financial needs that necessitate mom working? Yep. Uh, if that's the case, then really my word of encouragement or perhaps even rebuke would be to dad, you know, yeah. make sure you're doing your part yeah. so that mom isn't feeling all stressed totally. about these things. Yeah. Well, and I love that too, that it really struck me studying it. You go, all the principles in here, the man has already been challenged mm -hmm. to embody for 30 chapters, you know, so you go, he's been pressed to be this kind of person. Right. Of, and, but... Some men get off the hook where I get the paycheck and so I don't have to engage with the kids at this level. Yeah. And you're like, this is a dad training his kid, you know? And so I do think it's important to, um, to we're all in this together. Mm -hmm. And Proverbs puts a lot of that work out in front of them as a family. Let's figure out how we make sure we all win. Good. And that's what you want is like you said, curating it. So for me, when workers come to the house, Donna usually works with them. She's better at that. I'm like, all right, fine. Exercise your gifts. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So everybody wins. You got to find your way that works. Yeah. yeah, I can appreciate that. Yeah. Well, hey, great message. Thanks, Thanks for brother. being here. And uh, we are praying for you and all that's happening up there in D.C. Thanks, brother. Sounds exciting. Appreciate it. Yeah. Glad you were with us, too. And we'll see you next time on Postscript. Thanks for joining us for Postscript. Help us keep the podcast interactive by submitting your questions during the morning services. Learn more at faithbridge.org slash postscript.